We have all members of the board in attendance. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of our meeting dated July 24, 2001. Comments from board members, suggestions for changes on the July 24, 2001 minutes. Just one minor change on line 23 to have uh, my last name spelled correctly, L-A-P. Other suggestions for changes or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, I uh, may have a motion for approval. So moved. Uh, Mr. Keneally. Second, uh, Ms. Miller. <coughs> Discussion on the motion? All those in favor of approval of the minutes with the change of the spelling of uh, Mr. LaPlante's name to L-A from L-E, um, signify by raising your hand. Um, we have, actually Mr. Fristasi and Mr. Tranfaglia should be shown as abstaining since they weren't here. Oh, I'm sorry. So we will show uh, the uh, minutes approved by a vote of five in favor, uh, zero opposed, and two abstentions with uh, Mr. Fristasi and Mr. Tranfaglia uh, abstaining. Uh, next item on the agenda is old business, and the agenda shows no old business. Does anyone on the board have old business to bring up? Hearing none, next item on the agenda is new business, and we the agenda shows three items of new business. I understand that item number two has been withdrawn, and we have received a letter from uh, Jim Fisher, the president of Northeast Civil Solutions, on behalf of the property owner at 29 Broad Cove Road, withdrawing uh, that appeal. So item number two will be removed from the agenda for tonight. Item number one on the agenda is to hear the request of Michael N. and Diane G. Evans 204 Two Lights Road, tax map U15, lot 16, to construct a 12 foot by 21 foot 6 inch single story addition at 4 feet from the left side property line and 24 feet 6 inches from the right side property line. Are Mr. and Mrs. Evans here this evening? Um, which of you would like to make the presentation on behalf of the two of you, or you can each take part in the presentation? Um, first of all, we do have <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Evans. Um, we have your application. We have um, a number of drawings that you have provided, and we have some photographs you have provided. Is there anything else that you will want the board to have for your presentation? Not at the moment, no. no. Okay. Um, in that case, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, I really don't, I didn't, didn't really realize I'd be presenting anything as such, but as I stated there, I, I do want to put the addition on because we're a little short on room. We'd like to enlarge and maintain the existing setbacks as such because the entire building is non-conforming and, and all the drawings that I, I gave you were best I knew to, to meet every single code possible. So I guess I just asked that we can get approved. I'm not sure what else I'm supposed to present. And there may not be anything else for you to present. Um, like I said, we have the application, we have the drawings. Um, if you don't have anything else specifically that you wanted us to hear, um, I will open it up to questions from members of the board. Um, and you can answer any questions that people have. 
So any questions by board members for uh, Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans, I have a question for you, sir. On your application, uh, the setbacks from the property lines, on the bottom of that it said average setback of other buildings. And I interpret that as, I think it's 18 feet from the front, 150 from the rear. And I guess the, are the sides four and 115, or is it 11 and a half? Do you, do you have a copy of what I'm? Um, I did. I'm going to have my own copy out of that. Mr. Trent Faglia, what were you referring to? The, the application average, itself? The application itself, the average setback of other buildings <clears throat> in the immediate vicinity. I was having trouble interpreting those numbers. Mm. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, I don't have a copy of that you myself. Can feel free to. I'm just assuming that's 11 and a half feet down here. It's not 115 feet. Right? Uh, that's actually it's 11 and a half, yeah. too. By the, by the right photographs, right. it looks yeah, like 11. All of us are about the same. Uh, Mr. Evans, I have a question, and uh, Mr. Smith, this is something that can be addressed to you also, and, and that is whether this application is intended to include a request for a reduction of the side setback requirement under Section 19-4-3. B2, which is on page 36 of the ordinance. The bottom. He's before the, the, the board to, to, uh, to add on at no closer, but it is, it, it's, it's the same thing as a further reduction to the setback because it's less than the, than the reduced setback. <coughs> The wording is somewhat, <coughs> it's not the best wording for that section, but I do it, with, you know, I know it's the intent of, 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 I cannot authorize a permit to be with less than reduced setbacks for that particular district. Uh, so it, it stands to reason that, that what it means is any, any additional enlargement within less than a reduced setback would require Board of Appeals approval. But just so the rest of the board knows what I would, am looking at here, on pages 36 and 37 of the ordinance, um, page 36 is dealing with the enlargement, uh, well, under paragraph B2 on page 36, the ordinance deals with the enlargement of an existing non-conforming building on a non-conforming lot, which is what we have here uh, in the case of the Evans property. Um, At the bottom of page 36, it says that the Zoning Board of Appeals, upon written appeal, may grant a further reduction in the side or rear setback requirement if it finds that. And then there are paragraphs numbered small Roman 1, small Roman 2, and small Roman 3. Um, and small Roman 3 takes us into the conditional use standards, uh, which is where my reading of the ordinance tells us we have to go in order to approve this. <clears throat> and it goes on to say that the granting of such a reduction shall not be considered a variance, uh, but shall be handled in accordance with 19-5-5 conditional use permits. The key, what puts it here and not a variance also is the fact that the height shall not be increased. If it was going to increase the height, then we wouldn't be in this section. You'd have to go for a variance. Right. I, I don't know if that was a, a means of trade-off for the applicant to be able to take advantage of this section rather than a variance or not. I, I'm assuming <coughs> that would be what it was when it was originally written.
Questions for Mr. Evans? Mr. Pistassi. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I see the proposed addition on page one of your diagram submitted, but I'm not clear as to what is going in this. Is there a, a diagram that shows what's going in this expanded area? You mean in, into the proposed addition? Yes. Uh, that's on, would be explained on page two. It's coming off the back side of the, the structure saying the den and the extension to the kitchen. Okay, I'm looking at this page here. Yes, the, the addition is up near your fingers. Okay, I see a bath and an entry. Correct. That's on the back quarter, back uh, corner of the house. But you're not adding a bath or an entry? No. This is existing? That's the existing. Okay, as I, as I look at this, all right, would it be to the right that your addition is going to be, or is it going to be on the left? The addition is actually below your pen. It's down here? Those two. Where it but says the, den and the kitchen, kitchen addition in the den is, that's the addition. Right. Is this the front of the house? That's the front of the house. Uh-huh. <laughs> Plays a little bit up. It's, it's the portion of the kitchen and den that is measured on this drawing as 12 feet, okay. 5 inches by 20 feet, 8 inches. That's yes. correct. Mm -hmm. 20 feet 6. Did you say 8 there? I think it says 20 feet, 8 inches on the drawing. That's to the outside of the walls. Oh. Looks like. Yes, 20 foot 8. Dr. Chapman. Right, wait a minute. I'm not. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Joe, go ahead. Thank you. So, the, it, looking at this from Two Lights Road, Correct. the width of it is 25.8 feet. Correct. 20, 25 feet 8 inches. And you are expanding it back. You're eliminating a kitchen. Is that what you're doing? I'm not eliminating the kitchen. Man. Well, you're eliminate, eliminating the existing kitchen and putting it in back. No, we're just expanding and making a larger kitchen. Because right now, as okay. it is, it's... Okay, so that would be more of a dining area that you're adding, yeah. not, not the eating area. How, how deep is the building right now? Uh, front to back is, tw is, what, 24, 24 and a half or 25 feet. Yeah. Right. And... 24. All right, that would be to the end of the, ex the hall on this. Roughly to yes, the. Yes, it'd be on the. Uh, yeah, it'd be on that side. Okay. That is the existing wall. Is there a bulkhead in back of the building now? There is a bulkhead, yes. All right, and what are you doing with that? What I'd plan to do with that would be to leave the bulkhead there, go over it with the floor, and reintroduce stairs from the. where it says hall going up the stairs, uh -huh. putting in the stairs back down, going back down into the cellar there, where they were originally. Because the floor has already been framed off, and that's where the stairs were before they added the bulkhead. Okay, um, I understand now what you're doing. Um, besides the house being small, uh, could you kind of expand and elaborate as to why you're doing this, why you're going through all this expense to add these two, these two rooms? Well, the, right now the existing bedrooms upstairs, I was using one of them as a like a den or a little uh, <coughs> office for myself to work in and do little projects in. And my, uh, both my wife would like to turn it back into a bedroom for visits when my grandkids would come. My kids and grandkids would be coming, but they've already got plans to come and have nowhere to put them. And my, right now my daughter has moved back home, is in that room, and there's nowhere to put anything because it's such a relatively small house. Um, okay, the, I did drive by the house, it does look small, um, and I, my concern was not for you, but for, for your neighbor to the left, um, 
is, in, in my concern was, what are they what are they going to do with the snow when it when it snows in the winter time? Uh, it looked like it looked like the driveway was pretty close to your building, and this would extend it back another 12 feet, and it doesn't look like too many places to put snow. Well, what has been done in the past, the last, uh, I think about the last six, seven years, is that my son, who also plows out our driveway, has kindly plowed out their driveway and just shoved the snow in our backyard. And uh, it's all, I mean, he always pushed it right from uh, their wraparound driveway right straight into our yard and piled that up there. And I would presume that's what he's going to continue to do because he has no objections to pushing it there. All right. How far back would this go? How much space would be between the garage and this this addition for snow uh, to be pushed back? Yeah, I haven't measured it, but I'd have to judge it to be about 20 feet. That'd be that much. All right. Uh, have you talked to your neighbors about this? Have they? Yes, I have. Okay. They're here. Okay. Then I'll uh, I'll wait and hear what other people have to say. Then thank you. Dr. Chapman, <clears throat> just for clarification, on page one of your application, your existing structure was constructed, and you put 92. Is that what does that refer to? Is that 1992 that it was built? No, it was originally constructed 19 about 1910, 1912. So okay, so under your existing structure was constructed, you have 92. If you'd just clarify that, please, for all of us. Midway down it's on the first system. page. It's a septic system. No. Your existing structure was constructed, 92 approximate. I'm just trying to understand what that refers to. No, I mean, just like 92, definitely Sorry? That building was constructed by my wife. So it's approximately 92 years old, maybe, is what you're referring to. Okay, thank you. On the second page, you're simply adding a one-story addition, that's correct. Item C states that there's addition consisting of two rooms with no plumbing. Uh, that's a kitchen area. You're going to, I assume, use the existing plumbing? Is that why you said no plumbing? Right, the existing plumbing is going to be moving the septic tank back to the proper distance from the building. And I'm not going to be putting any plumbing in the kitchen area. It's just going to be gas, the storage, and the workspace. And then plus a little, uh, so we're going to put the table in the table easier. Mr. Evans, would you mind moving back to the podium simply so we can have you at the microphone? Sure. Thank you. So based on, Bruce, on your earlier dialogue with uh, the chairman regarding a one-story addition within the setback area, would you please confirm what you said again? This section that he's using, um, the requirement is that the height is, is not increased from what's already existing, what's already non-conforming. Uh, in order to take advantage of that. And the height will not be increased from what was already in that setback. So therefore, therefore, it doesn't have to go through the variance process. So, OK. So by maintaining a one-story addition, and he's not increasing what is already existing. Well, actually, by maintaining the height equal to or less than what's existing, whether that be one or two, Okay. is irrelevant. It's the height of what exists. As long as it's less than right. one or two for the new portion within the setback area. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Other questions? Just just have a question. We, we did get uh, Mike Hill's letter uh, regarding uh, what can be done in these non-conforming lots. But for Bruce, if he came in and asked us to go up with this building, could he possibly do that as opposed to go out? 
Only through a variance process, not through this section, no. But he, but he could take this and make it a full colonial house instead of a, a cape or whatever we want to call this, a cottage. If he applied for a variance, was successful with a variance, yes. Okay. He'd Just have to meet variance criteria. Well, I should, I, I guess I should elaborate. If there's two stories existing, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know that that's the case. I don't think it is, but it's the height that, that's, that, that's a limiting factor for using this section. All right. Could he go higher than this? No. He cannot go higher than this building right now? He can't go higher than, than what's in the non-conforming part of that lot. That's correct. And that's just about everything in the non-conforming part That's correct, of the lot. too. Yes, you're right yeah. to the center. Yeah. Uh, I, I do, uh, since we have a, a gap between applicate, uh, applicant one and, and three, we're getting a lot of um, uh, variance requests from the A zone, it appears. And it seems as though when they laid out the zones in Cape Elizabeth, someone took a broad brush and everything that, point, that side of, of uh, Town Hall seemed to be zone, zone A, which is your two-acre lot and your big setbacks. I mean, does, did anyone ever, has anyone sensed this also, that, that a lot of uh, applications are coming from the, the, the zone, uh, the A zone? Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if we might want to address um, the zoning Commission to see if they want to look at some of these lots and reclassify them C or even B. Seeing no response, I don't want to put you to sleep, so <laughs> I'll shut up. Well, no, you don't have to. You don't have to stop the line. I was just waiting to see if there was any more explanation for the the reason or the. the well, we're getting a lot of them, and the and the setbacks are 25 feet, and it's impossible for them to do anything to their properties. And we're getting a lot of these requests to, to grant variances. And I think you certainly that can petition either the planning board or and or the town council, but I think with what's happened in the last couple of years with setbacks and different things that had come before the board that, that I'm not too sure that, that at this point too receptive looking at setbacks again. I mean there's been some pretty good studies out there in the last couple of years on different issues. Um, we have a councillor here. I don't know if he'd like to comment on that, but well, that's why I made the <laughs> comment because the council is here, and, and uh, you know we do we are receiving a lot of them, and uh, it seems as though they just dumped it on our lap and said, "You guys deal with it," and which is what we're doing tonight. Well, we have another one coming up later on this evening, and again, it's the same situation. Uh, when they built the house uh, 40 years ago, there was no zoning. The setbacks were, were met. I think it was 15 feet. And then they were redefined now to 25 feet, and, and it's impossible for people to, to make changes without coming back before us. And the building restrictions are most dramatic in a case or in a neighborhood like the Evans, where the homes are less than a half dozen feet from the side property lines. And I don't think many of those lots met the 80,000. Um, well, I can't imagine that they're even close. What is your square the ones there along square lower footage of your lot, for example? Sir? What is the square footage of your lot? Uh, it's approximately, uh, let's see, as an average, be about 10,000 square feet. Yeah, which is one eighth of what, what is required in a, in a, a zone. 9,900, okay. It's not unusual in, 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 in a lot of towns to have similar situations where you have pockets of, of previously developed areas with small lots and they've zoned the surrounding area because it hasn't been so developed to a, a lot size that's, that's much greater than, than the, that exists in small development. Uh, and, and hence, that's why uh, boards of appeals were created to look at those situations that warrant uh, variances because of their, their uh, size. Well, I certainly sympathize with people that uh, have a small house and they want to expand it and, you know, they like Cape Elizabeth, they moved to Cape Elizabeth for a variety of reasons and Things happen, the families grow, and uh, they want to uh, uh, expand the house, and they're limited with what we have before us. So. Okay. 
I'm not running for public office or anything like that. Dr. Chapman. Uh, Bruce. He can, the applicant can apply for a one-story addition at this time and come back in the future and apply for a second story to this addition. Is that correct? Based on? As they could today, yes. Nothing changes. Right. Not once, under this section. So once the one story is added, a second story can be added on to that only based on the existing structure? Only through a variance to the Board of Appeals because an upward expansion less than the required setbacks is not anything my office can authorize. It has to come back to the Board of Appeals because it, is, it would be an expansion of a non-conforming structure. Non-conforming meaning less than the, the reduced setbacks that's, or the required setbacks. <coughs> so the same process is the, the same process before today. the Board of Appeals with under the variance criteria, yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans, I think we're finished asking you any questions for the moment. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the application? Come forward, please. And if you would please tell us your name and address. My name is Betsy Dawkins. I live at 202 Two Lights Road with uh, Kelly Fernald, who's also sitting in the back. Um, I live in the house that is um, the four feet away um, on, the, on the left side of the property, as it's stated in there. Um, and um, I took a look at where, where Michael and Diane were going to put the addition. And um, I don't think it really affects uh, my house or my property at all. Um, it is actually just going to be the same distance that the, that the house is now. It's just going to be extended back. Um, and I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. Uh, we have no problem with it. Um, I, in fact, the, the same type of addition was put onto my house. Our houses actually looked, look exactly similar uh, from the front. Um, and they were built like in 1900 and um, by the Coast Guard. And there was an addition right after World War II put on our house that is back sort of like what Michael and Diane want to do with their house to expand it. And, uh, and we're thoroughly in favor of it. Would you spell your last name for us, please? E-A-W-K-I-N-S. Thank you. Yeah. Um, with regard to the question that Mr. Fristasi had asked earlier about snow removal, yeah, from your driveway, does that present a concern to you? Not a bit. Like, like Michael said, um, uh, his son has, for how many years? <laughs> how old is he you now? Uh, has, for no charge, been moving my snow uh, out of my uh, driveway. And there is room. There is about 20 feet. I think you're right. Um, because my driveway makes a circle, but there's a, a garage right there, and there's, there's room to push it out of the way. So I don't think that'll be a problem. Well, what about when his uh, son is no longer doing the plowing <laughs> or is no longer generous I'll enough to do it for free, or they move away and somebody else is there? <laughs> um, would you have a concern? No, I don't, because the way the driveway goes is um, I have a driveway that goes right between my, my house and Michael's house and then it makes a left-hand curve and go, goes all the way back to the street. So what you can do is push the snow in front of my garage and then come from the other side and just push it right over, and it wouldn't be a problem. So if a subsequent owner was to put up a little white picket fence along their property line? Well, I don't, I don't could they, did you say? Sure. In fact, I'm not sure. Well, they could happened. have done that already. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. They could have done that already. Yeah. And I don't think that's a problem. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure if that's, that's what the issue here is. No, it's not the big issue, but the concern is the effect on neighboring properties. Mm -hmm. So we do want to take into account any adverse effect that it might have on your property. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the application? You would tell us your name and address, please. I'm uh, Wayne Brooking. I live at 208 Two Lights Road, which is two houses down from the Evanses. And uh, 
I don't have much to add. It's already been said. Uh, uh, my understanding is also that those all, last four houses on the left are all built about the same time by Diane's great grandfather, with just about 100 years ago. And since then, of the four, uh, three of us have added additions similar to this one on the back, and uh, uh, we get along pretty well with them. As far as the snow goes, my neighbor has to put his snow on me, but then again, when I put a ladder on the side of my house, the bottom of the ladder has to be on his driveway, so <laughs> it, you have to learn how to get along that way. So. And uh, other than that, I guess uh, I, I whole, whole, wholeheartedly hope that you approve the uh, application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brickin. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to the application? Um, seeing no one else to speak in favor or in opposition, uh, we will close the public comment portion of the hearing um, and open it for board discussion. I have an administrative question here. If we're required to do this under the conditional use, and conditional use requires that a formal application for conditional use approval has to be submitted. So are we hung up on that right now, too? Or? I don't think so. I don't um, talking about the formal conditional use application? Yeah. No, I think that there are a number of sections of the ordinance that take us back to this, and it simply requires that we, con we consider the various standards under um, 19-5-5D, um, and there are six standards there that... That is, that is the, that is the conditional system. use application, basically, wrapped into this application. That's what the question is. Yeah, that's, that's what I wasn't sure yeah. about. Yeah. I, I, I've spent the last couple of weeks trying to, trying to refine the applications and make them more specific to each particular section. And you'll see application A through H now. Um, and it will be specific. It will be the condition of use with the section added to it. So just for clarification. So that may be where you're getting a little confused. Um, I've tried to refine it so that it would make it a easy, little easy to understand. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I think for purposes of our uh, final vote, yay or nay on the application, we should go through um, two different sets of criteria. Um, first, if we look at pages 36 and 37 uh, of the ordinance, um, we're under 19-4-3B2, and then at the bottom, uh, small Roman 1. Um, in order to grant a further reduction in the side setback from 25 feet to 4 feet, as requested, we first need to find that the reduction is consistent with setbacks existing for other properties within the immediate neighborhood of the subject property. Um, so unless there's any discussion on that issue, um, as just um, an informal um, finding of, as to whether or not there are issues with any of these, um, all those who find that that criteria has been met, um, can we have a showing uh, of hands? And uh, finding that that has not been met? Or, Mr. Fristassi, would you like to approach this in a different way? Well, your question is, has it been shown to us? Well, or are we satisfied that that is the case? Okay. Asking it that way, yes, I am satisfied. Again, through a visual a drive by. Right. Um, we have seen a lot of people, a lot of applications before us where the applicant has taken the time to document it. And uh, that's been extremely helpful. But uh, in my, my particular case, I did do a drive by, and I'm satisfied that. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, it's, it's certainly expected um, of all board members that that they will do drive-bys um, of all the properties. Well, Jack's, Jack's point, I think, is well taken, that uh, the applicant is here to convince us. And with 
the way you asked the question the first, the first time, uh, I was not convinced. All right. He provided us with photos, and I can see a couple of these houses have the similar situations. But, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see more documentation if that's the way you're going to ask the question. Okay. Um, and again, the purpose here is that if the application fails for any reason, um, I think the applicant is, in, is entitled uh, to know, and certainly for purposes of further appeal, is entitled to uh, know the basis upon which uh, the application has been denied. So um, all those who are satisfied that uh, the first item, Roman numeral, small Roman one, um, that the reduction is consistent with setbacks existing for other properties within the immediate neighborhood of the subject property, that has been satisfied, a show of hands. Um, and we find that satisfied by a vote of seven to zero. Um, all those who find that the next criteria, um, small Roman two, has been satisfied. The nonconformity was created through a change in the town's zoning regulations. Um, and we find that satisfied by a vote of seven to zero. Um, and before we can go on to Roman three, we have to go on to the conditional use standards because Roman three says the request meets the conditional use standards of section 19-5-5D. So let's go to 19-5-5D on page 54. 54. 54. Um, 54. Thank you. And that says the board shall, after review of required materials, authorize issuance of a conditional use permit upon a showing that any conditions prescribed for such conditional use will be satisfied. Are there any proposed uh, conditions to impose upon the applicants? Hearing none, let's go on to the next standard, paragraph two. The proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, all those who are satisfied that that um, element has been met. That is satisfied by a vote of seven to zero. Uh, next, the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation all those who find that that um, element has been satisfied. Um, and that's found in the affirmative by a vote of seven to zero. Uh, next, item number four, the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. All those who find that that element has been satisfied. Um, that is also found in the affirmative by a vote of seven to zero. Next, item number five, the proposed, proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with a comprehensive plan. All those who find that that element has been satisfied. That's found in the affirmative. I vote of seven to zero. Did you vote on that one, Ms. Miller? Thank you. <laughs> um, and last, um, item number six, the design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design, appearance, or architecture. All those who find that that element has been satisfied. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of seven to zero, which necessarily provides us with an affirmative finding on the uh, small Roman three on page 37, which was that the request meets the conditional use standards of section 19-5-5. And with there having been no conditions uh, to attach for <coughs> approval, um, may I have a motion from someone uh, to approve the application? I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in the matter of um, an application for a lodgment of an existing non-conforming structure, specifically located at Map U15, Lot 16, owned by Michael and Diane Evans. I move that we accept their application as um, submitted. Discussion on the motion? Or actually, a second? Second. 
Uh, second, Mr. Keneally. Discussion on the motion. The motion was to accept the application or to, to grant the variance of the uh, conditional use? The motion was to approve the application. All those in favor of the motion, as presented? Opposed? The application is approved by a vote of seven in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Evans. You're welcome. Come back and see us again sometime. Next item on the agenda is item number 300, new business to hear the appeal of Greg and Catherine Miller, 7 Crescent View Avenue, tax map U16, lot 63, for a front property line variance of 9 feet from the required 25 feet and a left side property line variance of 2 feet from the required 25 feet to construct an 8 foot by 40 foot farm porch addition and a 24 foot by 40 foot second floor addition to the existing dwelling. And I see that we've lost one of our board members. I kind of feel like I have a split personality tonight. <laughs> and that is because one of our board members is the applicant. Would you tell us your name and address, please? Catherine Miller. Um, my address is 7 Crescent View Avenue, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm here on a different side of the podium to request a variance for our home located, um, as I said, on Crescent View. Um, it's a small neighborhood near Kettle Cove. It's um, when you're going to the, towards Kettle Cove, it's the little neighborhood on the right hand side. It's a square neighborhood with approximately 15 houses in it. It's a closed street. It's not really a cul-de-sac because there's houses on both sides um, and in the center, um, but it's a, a dead-end type street. What we're pro proposing to do today um, is to build a, convert our existing ranch, um, which is currently 960 square feet, into a two-story Cape-style home with a farmer's porch. We've selected the farmer's porch to kind of instill some of the historical value of the neighborhood in that it used to be farmland. Um, there's a farmer's house right around the corner um, on Kettle Cove Road, which is architecturally, um, historically significant. We would like to do a farmer's porch on the front of our house to kind of make that cape look more like a farmer's por farmer's home. What we are hoping to do is go up, increasing the square footage of the home, but not increasing the, the, blue, the footprint of the home on three sides. The, the left, the right, and the rear of the home will maintain intact. We will be expanding the front of the porch, the front of the home, to accompany the porch. So that would have a setback, I think it's nine feet we've requested. We will be needing um, a variance for. Currently the home is located 22 feet from the front of the property line. If you go visually inspect the property, it's, it appears to be much larger. It appears to be 32 feet. Um, the actual measurement from the road to the home is 32 feet, but of course we know that the, the road isn't always the true mark of where the property line starts. The property line is actually 22 feet. So we will need um, the 9 foot variance for the front porch. The side on the, the left side, when you're looking front of the home, the home front on, the left side, it has, the side setback would be 25 feet. But again, our house has been placed in a lot, on the lot, so that the side right now is 23 feet 
that left side will not be increased at all. Um, we will just be going up, so we won't be increasing the nonconformity there. We're requesting the variance for a couple of reasons. Um, one, this is not due to the unique it is due to the unique circumstances of the property, and it's not the general characteristics of the, the neighborhood. The property, our property, is on the cor a corner lot. When you drive into the neighborhood, we're, we're on the right-hand corner. For whatever reason, the house was placed in the far corner of the lot. Um, it's, a, it's a long rectangular lot, and rather than placing it in the center, they, they appear to put it in the far corner. Um, in so doing, the side setback is we only have 23 feet. The rear of the house to the um, rear property line is only 20 feet. It, the front, like I said, is only 22 feet. But on one side, we have 80 feet. So it, it's been mismatched in how it's been placed. I only assume it's been placed that way to um, have as much of an ocean view, even though it's not a great ocean view. It, I think they placed it there for that reason. It also sits nicer on the, um, the street in that when you're coming up the street, the house is squarely centered on the street so you can see it. So it's not due to the general characteristics of the neighborhood. There aren't many other houses that are centered in this unique capacity. The variance we've requested will not produce an undesirable change to the neighborhood. Um, it will increase the value of the home. It will be aesthetically pleasing. We're instilling some of the historical value that Cape Elizabeth appreciates in homes. So the neighbors are very supportive of this. And you can see in the application we have had neighbors that have reviewed our plans as submitted here and have been supportive of it. We um, have spoke to almost all the neighbors in the neighborhood, with a few exceptions. Um, but the neighbors all we've spoken to have been very supportive. There has been no opposition. In looking at the other homes in the neighborhood, it's clear that the homes are very close to one another. Um, as Mr. Fashtashi pointed out, this is one of those houses in the, uh, the A district. And clearly, it's not an 80,000 square foot lot. It's a 12,000 square foot lot. It's a much smaller lot than would, we would have hoped for now. The homes in the neighborhood vary greatly in with their distance. We have um, our neighbor to the right of us, um, which is on the map enclosed, the tax map. It's lot number 40. Um, I believe his, he indicated to me in talking, he had requested variance. Um, years ago, he was a ranch just like ours, and he did build a second floor to his house um, many years back. His front lawn, um, if you go from the property line to the home, is only 14 feet. Um, we've requested 16 feet, so we're in compliance when you compare to other homes. He is 14 feet. It, it, if, when you measure it out, it, I think it's 22 feet from it appears to be. Um, looking at the other houses, the houses range. Some houses have um, 20 feet from the road, some have 22 feet. And, and for visual expect, inspection, you know that, it, it, in fact, it's even less. So the, what we've requested, it really would not put our house in any different capacity. It's, it, it's really what the neighborhood, unfortunately, has been designed to have. Did you have a question? Catherine, could you clarify? You mentioned a lot 40, and you mentioned it's 14 feet, but it looks like 22 feet. Your table here says 27 feet. So. OK, maybe. Then it, it appears even larger. It appears to be 27. It, yeah, I estimated just okay. from talking. It appears to be larger. When you, when you look, measure it out from the road to the house, it, it measures to be 27 feet, because that was one that we did actually measure. Okay. Okay. And um, it, in fact, is only 14. So my point is that the houses appear to be even further than they are. So that's the same case with your home as well. Exactly. It, and on the, the list I've given you, I've put down 32 feet for mine, because that's when you measure it out. Um, it is 22 feet. So I've averaged it to be about a 10-foot to 12-foot cutoff from where the town's property is to where the actual property line starts. Catherine, I didn't follow that at all for some reason. OK. When you if With lot 40, you said you measured it to be 27 feet. What is the 14 feet? That's what his actual the deed tells you his property line is. Which is what we go you're talking, by. You're talking about the deed reference. Absolutely, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Right away, extends beyond the pavement, right. basically. Right, exactly. Right. Um, and that's the case in our lot too. Our our lot appears to be 32 feet on visual inspection. Right. When you when you get the survey, it appears it is 22 feet. 
So there's about a 10 foot land that it is, it's not there, which makes it difficult when you're going to get an application of a variance because you have less land than you thought you did. So there are a lot of homes that are different. But with respect to the side setback, which is also a concern for us, the homes vary also. There's, I believe, one house that's a, a four foot, um, four feet to the property, in the next property line, four foot setback. And clearly that's not something that we would do today, but that's how the houses are designed. We are not going to be expanding our side any further. We're just increasing it up, so that's really not making it any any um, worse of a violation for the setback. <coughs> the um, situation we're in tonight isn't a result of something that we've done. It's the way the house was designed in the 1950s. Um, 1950, there were different ordinances with respect to minimum lot sizes and for the setbacks. At the time the house was built, of course, it was in compliance of both. Now we're faced with stricter regulations and ordinances, and that's why we have to petition you for the variance. There's really no alternative for us to build. Um, if you are looking at the house front on, um, we can't go back because we already are within 20 feet of the back property line. We can't go to the right because unfortunately the septic tank is in, in the leach field has been designed to be right close to the property. I think that was to save money on piping. They put the leach field right on top of us, so we would have to really remove the leach field. Um, which isn't practical because I don't think we have enough room then to relocate it. We certainly can't go much beyond our front because they're already petitioning you. So we're really left with the alternative to go up. The application we've submitted um, and the variance that we're requesting is something that um, will not have any impact on the neighborhood. It will not have any impact on the natural environment. There really are no environmental concerns. Denying the application, however, would cause us a practical difficulty in that this is something that the houses in the neighborhood have been expanded. Um, Cape Elizabeth permits land users, landowners to do things with their land, including expand their property, their homes. We are looking to expand our home, but if, we, if we're unable to, due to the way our house has been laid on the lot, it will be a, an economic injury to us. The homes in the neighborhood have been selling well lately, and it's usually because people want to expand it. They say they're small homes, 900 square feet in a home today is not a big home. People immediately, before they even move in, have been expanding them. If this was to be denied, and we were to try to sell the home to then buy a home that we could live in, which can house our family, um, we would have to disclose the fact that this was something that really can't be expanded on. We tried to get the application for the variance and we've been denied due to the town's ordinance, so it would cause an economic injury. The house also abuts a vacant lot to the left of it so that there is nobody on the left, which is the side that we're concerned about for the variance. Um, it's, it's empty lot. It's not a buildable lot because there is no means of egress uh, so that there isn't any concern on that end of it. And lastly, um, what we're trying to do is really, like I've said, convert our home into a two-story home. When you're looking at the other homes in the neighborhood, many of them have already been converted. In looking at the tax map, um, our house, what we are proposing to do with our house will be comparable to many other homes. Um, I didn't put this in the application, but I can tell you that the size and the location of the house we're proposing, the changes we're proposing, would make our house similar to lots number 36, 40, 41, 42, 45, 57, 58, 48, 49, 59, 52, and 53 in our immediate area. And then if you go beyond, there's even more homes beyond our, our immediate neighborhood, which it would make it in conformity with.
So I, th I think that I presented everything that's in the application, if there's any questions. Questions for Ms. Miller? Your existing septic system, you said, was, I guess, it would be to the right of the house if you're looking at it from the front. Right. Like a 75 foot um, setback is, right? Right. Correct. That's a fairly new septic system. Um, it is. That's a question, Bruce. Bruce, once um, if, if an approval is given for this um, request, which is really just a request for proposed porch at this point, at some future point, could this owner or another owner? without coming before us, convert that into a closed space for additional lodgement of the house? Yes. So there'll be no more approvals required for that? No. Unless we put a condition on it. I would recommend that you don't put a condition unless, unless that change would throw out one of the criteria that you're going to approve if you approve this. I mean, if the same conclusions are in, in, in fact in place, whether it's closed or not, um, well, it changes the appearance, but it's not pretty. But, but you're not looking at appearance in this application, are you? Um, it changes the feeling of intensity of development, I think, whether it's an open porch or whether it's enclosed space. It, it would, if, if the board, you know, wishes to do that, they, they have every right. I, I, it's it's going to become an, a hard thing to track if, it, if it's a continual thing as variances are granted. It, it will make it quite a nightmare. <laughs> If nothing else. <laughs> Comment understood. <laughs> the, where we're requesting the porch, the line for the porch to be, to end, is really not different than many people's homes in the area. So that we happen to be requesting a porch, which isn't part of the, the structure of the home. We're not adding a room that way. Yeah. But many people certainly have their, their main dwelling is that close to the road. So it, it, the porch is really, it's not much different than the other homes in the neighborhood. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is we, have right now an existing um, stair porch, like a stairs that are on the home. That does go out right now six feet, two inches. The porch we're requesting is going to be six feet. So it's really the same distance, but we already have the same structure. It would just be extending it to the length of the home. Um, so it's really, it's, we're not really going out much further than we already have with our existing little porch. Our existing porch is only five feet wide. And clearly, we want to make this the entire length of the home. Didn't we have a lengthy discussion on that same issue on another application um, before? There was one approved, and then there was some changes, and the board board got into a discussion as to, you know, can we require that the plan be followed? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the end result was that unless we have something in here that specifically says that you can approve it or, or disapprove the facade or the appearance, then the board needed to stay away from that. I'm not sure that we have, you have the discretion to require that a, a certain facade remain in effect. Um, it, you know, it, it, the only thing, you know, is what it says is determining whether variance would have an unreasonable detrimental effect consider the variance would have an effect of blocking the establishment view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow, or reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10 percent or more, or eliminating the privacy. Uh, I suppose one could put in that, that if it's going to be ugly, it could reduce the appraised value, but I, I'm not sure that that's what it intended. Um, you know, I think there's a danger, and as I said before, when you get in a discussion of that other application that had been changed, there's a real danger of, of trying to track that in my oh, office. It's, it's it. almost, if it specifically says that, though, I, you know, I, I, the board has discretion to do that. Right. Um, I see Jay's got his hand up, but to follow up on that, I'm not comfortable giving approvals for a footprint and then not letting the applicant do whatever they want to do within the 12-month period that this variance is good for. And, and you're right, uh, Bruce, and that's why I asked earlier uh, this evening about what do we grant? Do we grant a variance to build a structure and then the porches and decks are extra and they come down the road that 
and this was an issue, and I know the one you're talking about, um, and I saw something today that I didn't like because I didn't vote on that. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, to make sure that what we vote on is what the applicant is actually going to do. And if we, give a, if we give a variance to build an open porch and we drive by 12 months later and it's enclosed or it's, in fact, part of the building, I mean, I don't vote for things like that. I vote for an, enclosed, an open porch or a deck, but it's certainly not a, a, a footprint that allows them to do what they want to do. <laughs> it's, the issue is always, in, in my years of experience, the issue has been you look at the setbacks and, and based on the footprint of being either one or two story. Uh, not necessarily whether it's going to be an open porch or, or, or an addition. Um, although I know of boards that have specifically re required that a deck variance be granted and not, it never can be closed in. But unfortunately, that just gets lost in time. Well, we did that uh, several years back. Uh, they were real close to the side property line, and it, the, the, the variance was given to have an open porch, never to be enclosed. And the applicant understood that, and the board understood it, and that's what we voted on, whether it's the same now. And like I say, if, there's, if, if, there, if that's something the board wants to entertain, then, and it fits within their authority to do so under the criteria, then so be it. I'm not sure that that. OK, just let me, just let me get, ask one question, and uh, I want to be straight on this. If we vote tonight to, to grant the millers the opportunity to put that farmer's porch on, are we giving them the opportunity to put a fully enclosed uh, addition on the front of the building? Is that to your interpretation? To the, to the setback to allow an addition. Um, like I say, if you think, if, if the board has, if think they have the authority to, to say that it has to be an open porch, uh, and they choose to do that, then so be it. I'm just... Well, the application clearly states a farmer's porch. Right. That's, that's what they're requesting. It does not include, in this particular one, it does not ask for an addition to the front of the building. And if I were to vote on this, I'd be voting on a farmer's porch and certainly not an addition. And if I went back, if I went back based on your interpretation and I saw an enclosure, I'd be very upset. And I think I'd ask for, for some type of limitations as to so what that means. Do. If somebody does a, an, a 10 by 12 addition for a kitchen, as like the applicant before, let's say that was a variance, and they wanted to do an open deck next year, they couldn't do it because you approved a, an enclosed addition. No, you're, that's, that's a lesser item. Well, who, who says it's lesser? The well, we, gra we granted them that. We gave but the owner next door might, might be happy with the enclosed because it, they, they still got their privacy. But if they put a deck on, they could lose their privacy. So it can work both ways. If you want to approve specific applications the way they're, they're presented, I have no problem with that. And I'll enforce it. I'm just saying that, that I think that is, is going to become a real nightmare to track. And I'm not okay. sure how I'm going to do that. And I understand that. And I sympathize with, with your position. But maybe we should poll the board to see what their thoughts are on this. I mean, my thoughts are we're voting for an on an application before us for specific use. And, and Jack, you brought it up. I mean, I'm, I'm throwing it back in your court now. I'm, I'm saying I'm voting for a farmer's porch. Uh, I'm not voting for an enclosed porch in this particular case. And sorry, sorry to use you and as an example. I realize that this is something we should resolve as a board. Um, and if I can switch hats for a second on a board hat. That is something I am willing to, for the purposes of this application, say that I am not going to enclose it um, and make it part of a kitchen. Um, the only thing I, I would like to kind of carve out as a caveat is if somebody, if we, I don't anticipate screening it in, but I would hate to not have that ability, like still keeping it as a porch, not part of a dwelling. Um, I'd like to, if I was to limit myself, I'd like to <coughs> limit myself to that. I don't anticipate doing that. I don't anticipate doing that in the near future. But I'd like to make that, if I was to limit myself, I'd like to give myself a little bit of room. And I have no intention and will not be expanding the house in that direction 
once this is, <laughs> work is done, we're not going to be knocking out any walls. Well, to carry Joe's concern one step further, as I understand what you're saying, Bruce, is not only could the applicant or a subsequent owner enclose the porch entirely and make it in an, a year-round room, but they could actually make it a two-story enclosure. No. No? What, what would keep because them from doing the that? Because the second floor would be an expansion of a non-conforming structure because it would be increase of floor space within the setback, which means that the board would have to review that again. Okay. See, I, I'm not sure where this all stops. You put a screen on a, on a farmer's porch. Still a farmer's porch. Put windows on there. Is it still a farmer's porch? Maybe, because it's not being used in the winter. Put heat in there, but you don't finish off the inside of the farmer's porch. I mean, where do we... Where, how do we control that, and where do we, where, who makes the call after what, they, what they're going to do? I mean, in, unless you specifically say that'll stay open exactly the way the plan calls for, um, I don't know how I'm going to enforce it. One I think it's important to understand the, 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 the floor, the area that is taken up within the setback and the distance to a property line. I think that's what the board's charged to do. Beyond that, I, I think we're running into a, a, a gray area. Well, I, the re I, I realized it was a thorny issue when I brought it up. The reason I brought it up, Bruce, you're talking about now the, the technical details of the way the intention of zoning regulations get implemented. But the real intention of the whole, whole body of zoning regulations is to limit the intensity of development of land. And the visual intensity is part of that, and sometimes a very important part of that. And to my mind, an open porch has a significantly different impact on the visual intensity of development than enclosed space does. And, and now, I whether we deal with that or not is another question, but that was my feeling about <coughs> And I appreciate your comments. And, and what I would have liked to see, though, because we did have this discussion before, and it seemed to me that the conversation ended with, with and I, correct me if I'm wrong, that that wasn't something the board was going to be controlling, was what what that area would be used to for in the future. And I may be wrong on that, but I think that's where it ended. Had I known this was still an issue with the board, or if, if it is still an issue, we can get interpretation from the town attorney on, on exactly what, what you can put on for restrictions. But this, if it, this has come up before, we have had this discussion before, and we're going around to the same circle of what we already discussed. And if, we, we, if you want it to get resolved, we can't. I'll, I'll get the town attorney to look at it. Um, well, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure the town attorney rendering an opinion necessarily provides any better answer than the zoning board rendering its opinion does, unless there is case law existing that would, that would pertain to this. I think uh, the board well, is I, I actually kind of agree with Bruce on that to the extent that, you know, if we were operating, operating under a conditional use, um, an application where we have the opportunity to put conditions upon the approval. I'm not sure that under a variance we even have the ability to place those conditions, just looking at the terms of the ordinance, as opposed to voting it up or down, in which case if we vote it, if we approve it, they have the right to do whatever the ordinance permits them to do. Um, I think the concerns that you're raising are good ones, but I've been listening to Bruce talk and listening to Bruce um, express his concerns about the gradations from open to screened to glassed to year-round living space. Um, Bruce raises good points that I think we simply need to be mindful of. Where we want to come out on it, I don't know, but I think we just have to be mindful of any decision we make. Well, Bruce's points are very good, and I recognize that if this were to be a recurring thing, it becomes a nightmare for Bruce and his successors to be able to uh, enforce this as far as any future owner of such property might want to make a change. But I, I do think it's something worth considering. My argument is that an applicant is coming to us selling us on a specific use. Not a and use. I'm, well, a specific use of a, for a specific purpose. And they're, and they're trying to address all the items as to why they should be given the, the variance. And if they use it, and one of them is, is the um, uh, adverse effect on the neighbors. If someone takes a porch, for example, 
and puts plywood up and puts some uh, $29 storm windows on the exterior of it and closes it, I don't believe that that's enhancing the value of the, of the abutting properties. And that's why I, I feel as though if a person comes to us and says I'm going to have an enclosed porch or I'm having a specific purpose, we are voting on their um, designs, we're voting on their argument, and we're not voting on, on a future license to make some changes. I'm not sure if the but floor is still open, if I'm still able to. I'm sorry? Am I, am I closed out now, or are you guys? No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to stop now, and I think that this probably should be debated either in workshop or, or some, other, uh, some other forum, but right now uh, I think that your application should be given consideration. With all due respect, though, um, any application that comes forth, people are coming forth with a specific use, whether it be a kitchen, a den, a garage, and at any time that they leave with an application, a variance granted in their hand, they can change that use, and they can do it any way they want. They can do a shabby job, and they can certainly make a garage out of the plywood that you were talking about on a actually, porch. Actually, they're coming to the board for specific residential use, one use. Right. Whether it's a kitchen or a deck or a den or an open porch, it's still a residential use. That's my point. Your example of the $29 storm windows, one, they're not going to come and get a permit from me. And two, am I going to make a call whether now that it's not a front of a farmer's porch, but it's something else? I mean, when does it become something other than the farmer's porch? Um, as soon as it's enclosed. That's your interpretation? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, getting back, just touching on what David had asked the question. On um, page 52, the conditions, the board may impose such conditions to a variance as it deems necessary. And that's purely the decision of the board, what it deems necessary. So we could, if we, don't, if we felt that it was necessary or desirable, apply any condition we want to this. Um, where, where are you reading that? Page 52. Page 52, 19-5-4B. And Mr. Keneally's right. In following the discussion, though, one thing that is bothersome is the lack of definition or the gray area in terming of enclosed. For instance, if this application were to be approved, there should be nothing barring the applicant from putting screens up, making it a more hospitable area to enjoy an evening. Now, if that means I would never encourage knocking down the front wall and making it living space, but if we're going to put limitations, they should be able to put storm windows up to prevent snow and, and rain coming in, and also screened in, if that's her desire. But <laughs> I understand where you're going, Bruce, but that's, to, to, we have to, if we're gonna place limitations on it, then we have to define the definition, we have to define <coughs> closed. Otherwise, how do you enforce anything like that? I, what I'll probably recommend the applicant is just go to the board for a closed in, and then you can do anything less than that, I guess. I, I don't know. It, it just, yeah, I think we're creating a lot of hardship on the applicant. And are we ever at the point that we, well, I, we, I suppose we could get to the point that we could actually require the applicant to provide us with an architectural rendering uh, to attach to the decision that is recorded. How else could we enforce the specifics of some of these without that? Well, I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating this, but and the board certainly could articulate a condition with enough definition that it would be clear what the limitations were. I'm not advocating we do that. I'm just saying that we certainly could do that. Oh, in this case, I think we could. Yeah. In others, I think we'd find it more difficult. But I think in this yeah. case, with an open right. porch, we could. Right. We need to recognize a member on that side. <laughs> uh, I just, um, my observations on this on this subject, and sorry to digress a bit, uh, Catherine, is I think that's the purpose of the board. I mean, if the ordinance had the power to stand by itself, there would, there would be no need, I think, for, for interpretation. There's an obvious void. Um, what comes to my mind with a similar variance two months ago was an applicant that, that uh, met the setback uh, on the front, but there was uh, one neighbor who had a concern on appearance, and there was a discussion over a bay window or not. And, and by code, uh, the bay window wasn't the entire 
vertical dimension of the first floor, so it wasn't to be included. But we were very sensitive to the to the neighbor's perception, right. and I think, unfortunately, that's what our business is. It's basically a case by case to fill that void, and I think the stronger the application is, the more documentation from neighbors, the more physical presence of neighbors, both pro and con, and I think it's easier to do our job. I think it's very difficult with a well-written application to try in one setting, um, make sure that we've, you know, that there's, there's, uh, there's, there's the variants can handle every potential uh, outcome. And I don't think, you know. Um, but in the case of the bay window, you didn't ask the applicant to, to do nothing but a bay window. You asked the applicant to set it back to the setback that the neighbor was happy with. So it, was, it, it directly was to do with the setback, not to the issue of the bay window. Right. But it had to do with the, with the perception with the percep of, of the impact on the neighborhood. And, and I think, uh, you know, the board responded to that. Well, if the members of the board think that they can define the openness enough that you'd like to try this to try and place um, our first condition um, on a variance for future use. We can try that as part of any motion that's made. We'll simply leave it up to the board to try and craft uh, by wording the appropriate restrictions to limit it to use as a farmer's porch. I mean, the board can simply say that the variance is approved per the plan, and, and everyone that comes before you, if that's your concern, is that you will review what's before you then per the plan. Then from that day on, I'll keep that in the file, and nobody will make any changes without coming back before the board, whether it be to close in the farm porch or, or to do anything to that plan. That's where we're heading with this, and that would be easy for me to, to track because I'd have the plan in there, but the plan would have to be right to the T. You know, and any change to that within that nonconformance would will land back here with this board. Well, but I think if we're going to do that, in fairness to the chain of title in the future, it has to be sufficient that anybody going to the registry of deeds uh, will be able to determine without coming back to your office whether or not there's been a violation. So you're going to ask them to to do what? I think whatever the restriction is that is going to be defined, whatever the condition is, that condition has to be in recordable form that is discoverable by a search of the registry without having to come back to your office to have the plans in hand and compare it to a photograph of the house that they might have in hand at the moment. That would, that would be creating a nightmare mm -hmm. for enforcement. Well, I think you agree with that. I agree with that. Bruce, when you give them the okay that they recorded the registry of deeds couldn't you just put a little um, sentence on it saying see conditions imposed by the zoning board August 28th the year well, 2000 if you approved as submitted then you've got it covered anyways period well I'm just thinking you know David's talking about uh, something at registry of deeds and if someone would look at that. this if they sold this property and the mortgage inspector would go down there and see that it was, it was um, out of the building envelope, he would check to see if a variance was given, correct? Yeah. That's all they do. That, that's all they check, though, is whether a variance was given. But they would look to see it. They would read it. Well, well they I, don't. I, they look to see what the setback was. That's all they care. Your title attorney. Your title attorney should bring that out at the, at the closing. Excuse this, me? The title attorney should also bring that out that it was given with, with stipulations. Well, I can see anyway, we've got, an app, we've got an application before us, and I think that uh, we should give it some consideration. That's Is there any way you can word it? Um, I know that I'm not a contractor, but certainly any, any expansion of a house needs to have sufficient foundation. Um, I think we talked before about, um, is it a frost, a frost wall or? Can have peers. Can have a peer foundation. Son of Duke. I was going to think maybe we can just swear this that it, it would it could not have a, a 
through foundation. I mean, that was it has to have it, a foundation. Okay. Well, let's go forward with the consideration um, of the application, and if we find that somebody wants to tack on a condition for approval, we'll debate it further, um, as opposed to the discussion in the abstract, which and I agree with you, Joe, maybe it is an appropriate issue for us to have um, as a separate workshop. Let me ask the applicant, um, how would you feel about a condition being attached that would limit you to an open pool, which limited to perhaps screening in the future, but no more intensive? Um, I would, I'd be comfortable with that. Um, I think that for changes to be implemented, thing, for conditions and attached to variances, I think that's something that we should give notice about rather than after I've submitted the application. However, in spite of that, I, I'm comfortable, I know that I'm going to use this as a porch. I'm not looking to expand any part of the house into this area to make it livable area. Um, and maybe that's how you could word it, that this would be non-livable space. Um, but if it's a matter of not having the application considered tonight or approved because I'm not willing to put some conditions, I would put some conditions on it. Um, but I'd like to have it some way, because my husband isn't here tonight, he's watching it on television, but I would have liked to consult with him before I limit what we plan to do with our house. With talk to him. Question. Dr. Chapmas. The existing configuration of the house is now three bedroom, one bath. It is. And after the proposed addition, it will be three bedroom, two bath. It will be. Regarding the face of the house, mm -hmm. uh, just regarding the porch, is the face of the house being moved at all? No, the face will be the same. It, it will be expanded in an upward direction um, and there's plans submitted that you can see that this if face if you're to look at the the front face the front, of the it's house not expanding not one inch it's going up okay. and it'll have three dormered windows you referred in your application or, and mentioned that the lot to your left is a non-buildable lot it appears from the uh, from the tax map that that's an extension of the larger lot is that not correct that's not a separate lot it's a portion of the larger facing I saw the taps map and I had the same thought you did why because people um, the owner of the, <coughs> the house has always called it and, and there's a large board. barn that's right that's all on, is that all on that the, was all the, that was the farmhouse for the tract of farmland that are, once was the whole neighborhood um, the the owner of the farmhouse has called that a non-buildable lot I think when I looked at the tax map, it, it appears to be part of their backyard is an extension. I don't think that they can separate that out because I think they need that yardage for the acreage for their home, which is a multi-unit home. So I don't think they can parcel that off. So whether it's part of their home or it's a lot that just um, they can't really sell because they, can't, they need the, the acreage. On your existing floor plan, you show a rear deck that I guess I couldn't see from the street. Uh, we actually don't have a rear deck. Um, the survey, well, it, it, it's actually the garage. The survey. Behind the garage on the, looks like page 16, and then it's labeled existing first floor plan. It shows a rear deck. Is that? Existing? Oh, no, that's not there. That um, The architect put that on and he said it would look nice. We don't have plans to build that. You're not building a rear deck? Um, not at this point, no. Because that would encroach on your setback. Yeah, would it? and that's why we're not. Um, okay. So we can disregard the, yeah. the, what's labeled as deck on the rear deck. The architect deck. kind of showed us where the house could go if we wanted, and we're not, we're not doing that. Okay, so you plan nothing on the rear of the house at all, correct? The you list or part of your enclosure in your packet, you have a sheet labeled statement of approval from a number of neighbors. Uh, notably absent from that list are houses number four, which is directly to your rear, number five, which is directly to your right, and number 20, which is across the street 
has this change been discussed with them and if it has what is their their uh, uh, opinion since it is not those are not listed on your approval yeah, statement. I'm, can you say the number number four um House number four. Which, number, I'll, I'll take each one in turn if, that's, if you don't mind. House number four. Um, I which is right me. behind you, I believe. I'm um, actually. Could be lot 62. Lot, okay, that's better. Why don't we go with the lots? That might be make. It's, it's, it's on your side. Lot 62, the woman um, is, her name is Deborah Jackson. She's completely supportive of it. Number she wasn't four. home when we got, we, she wasn't home when we circulated the petition. So, um, no, she has no objections. Number four behind you was supportive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number five, across the street to your right. She also supportive. She volunteered to come tonight, um, and she had some dinner plans, and I told her not to cancel the dinner plans on my account, and she said she was supportive and would have done anything to help us have this approved. She's completely supportive. So to your knowledge, there are no objections from no. House number four or five? No, there are no objections to anybody um, that we've spoken to, and we've spoken to almost everybody in the neighborhood, with a few exceptions. When the night we circulated the petition, though, we were limited to who was home. So. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have to be concerned with any proof that the septic system can handle an additional bathroom? Bruce? How many bedrooms is there? It's three bedrooms. Three and proposed is three. Mm -hmm. But there's no increase in the number of bedrooms. Okay. Other questions for Ms. Miller? Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak in favor of the application? Anyone here to speak? Yes? Speak in favor? Well, would you tell us your name and address, please? Uh, Lois Ewing, H. Crescent Hill Avenue. And your last name? Ewing, E-W-I-N-G. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Ewing. I have absolutely no objection. Uh, I've been there for 31 years. There have been a lot of additions. Uh, people tend to stay in that neighborhood once they get there. and. Uh, Everyone who has done anything there has done a fine job. They've been doing a beautiful job for their house. I see no objection at all. If I were a lot younger, believe me, I'd put a second story on mine looking down toward the ocean. So where is 8 Crescent View in relation to 7? Are you directly across well, the street? No. <laughs> Ask your 911 people about all that stuff. <laughs> it's down the street. A little bit, and on the it's lot 55. I mean, eight. I drove 55. 55. I'm sorry. Quick change, quick. I can see the house. Questions for Ms. Ewing? Thank you, Ms. Ewing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Seeing no one else here, unless uh, Council Roberts would like to speak in favor or in opposition to the application. Um, that will close the public comment portion of the hearing and we will open it for uh, board discussion. Um, and I'd suggest that to the extent that there's going to be discussion, we focus on the obvious and that is whether or not there is an interest in adding a condition that the farmer's porch be used for nothing more than um, an open porch and not be enclosed at any time in the future. Dr. Chapman. Uh, I have a question for Bruce. Bruce, using this property as an example, if the proposed farmer's porch is approved as planned, and this property owner or a subsequent property owner approaches you to screen in that porch, that would require a building permit, I assume. No. If they, to screen it in would not. If they place the windows and make it an enclosed porch, that would require a building permit. Not unless it 
requires some structural change. So no building permit is required to enclose this porch? To put windows or screens in, no, unless it requires structural change. That's not a structural change, so therefore it wouldn't require any sort I of I can permit. look in the code, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, I don't believe that, that, that placing windows in existing openings would require a building permit. If, if they framed them, had to frame them in to be smaller. Sorry? If they had to frame them in to, to make smaller windows, yes. But if they simply put glass in the openings, no. So they could put up screens and... I mean, chances are, because of the size of the openings, they would come, they would have to frame them in, so therefore it would require... So if they uh, place studs them. for support, right? screened it in, that's not structural, but if they added, if they framed in windows, or is, is that the, the key, is framing in? Well, s <coughs> I would think so. I mean, if I, if I saw somebody petition off of a porch with, with two by fours and throw up some screen, I probably wouldn't ask them for a building permit because there's no safety issue there that, that I can see. Uh, whereas with the glass, um, there is restrictions for glass sizes and distances from the floor, whereby you might have to have safety glazing or regular glass. So that coupled with the, with the structural members being added, then I would require a building permit. So if, if any attempt was made to heat this area, which would require walls and windows, that would require a building permit. Correct. To enclose this. And in which case, could you issue that permit without coming back to the board? Could that permit be issued or would that require a variance to enclose that area and bring it, make it interior space, heated space? Depends on how you approve the application. You're saying it depends on whether or not we add a condition that it remain open? Correct. Now, if we did not add any condition, if we approved the plans and a subsequent property owner came in and wanted to frame that in, insulate the walls, put in windows, and a door and bring that into interior space, whether they knock out the existing front wall or not, they could just open the windows or simply remove the glass and bring that in as interior space, make it a yes, I walk would, out and close. That would be court. an approval through the code office, yes. Sorry? That would be an approval through the code office. Okay, so that would not require any uh, reapproach to the board? No. Okay. That, that's just a point of reference to the board that I think is significant, uh, maybe significant, that this farmer's porch could ultimately be the front facade of the house, whether it has a foundation or not. But it has to have that a foundation. That could become a new front door and a new foyer entryway area for the house with no subsequent approval by the right. board. And Maybe that's a relevant consideration, not for this case, but for any cases. And that reverts back to the discussion you had earlier as far as enforcement of this. But one, that, the board, would, I think the board should ask themselves what specific section of, of the questions, what specific questions would, would uh, make that change change the approval? If you're not, unless you're looking at Pacific facades, uh, which I think that's a dangerous place to go, I'm not sure what would you what would you look at for change. Let's say you said it had to be a front porch, and and I sent him back to you to put just glass on. What would you look at? What would have changed at that point? Anything? The possibly the character of the neighborhood. There's a, in my mind, a significant visual difference from a very attractive farmer's front porch on a house versus an enclosed, extended front wall of the porch. It 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 could affect the visual appearance, and and part of our charge of the board is is to address that issue. And if we are approving a situation that could be 
significantly altered in the future without concern. I think it's to some extent our obligation to realize what could transpire from our approval of an open porch. Okay, so you approve an open. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that this particular case or any case. I think this is an issue that needs to be worked out because there is a, a, a concern with tracking and enforcement of this 20 or 50 years from now. But I think we should also realize that the the front profile that was distributed to us as part of the a packet, uh, uh, the applicant's packet, suggesting that this is how the alteration will improve the appearance of the neighborhood, where, where, that this where could does, be altered. Where does it say that? Sorry? Well, I was just curious, where does it talk about improving the appearance of the neighborhood? I think that's one of the An undeniable change in the character. I guess my I, point I, is, I, short I, of, short of, I short of, said character. let me just say one thing. Short of approving the plan as is, completely. If you do, if you even if you put wording in that it says remain a farm porch, that's that still gives the opportunity for the person to blow the farm porch away next year and build another farm porch with a roof with a 14, 12 pitch on it that may not be in the character of the neighborhood. So that's why I keep coming back to this. If you, if you want to do that, I think you need to look at the plans and say, this is all you can do. You can't do no more. Otherwise, there's all kinds of different ways that they can get around that or, or change it. And if that intent is to, is to say, this is what we want, and this is the only way we'll grant this variance, then you've got to approve that facade as it is. And any changes to that cannot ever happen without you guys approving it. In response to your question, Bruce, I would, on the bottom of page three of the application, sentence that begins on the bottom of page three, a variance would allow this property to undergo significant improvements which would positively impact the surrounding properties. Proposed changes have been reviewed and supported by the neighbors. And it's been a specific proposed change uh, reviewed and supported by the neighbors. So again, but, the question but is But there's how no criteria for, for the neighbors to approve or disapprove. It's just something that all applicants, I recommend that I they get the support that of the neighbors. 100%, but we do know that the board's disposition but sometimes is influenced by that. But well, you could have a neighborhood that, 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 that was completely out to lunch mm -hmm. on, on what, was, what, what, was, what was right and what was wrong. Well, the board you can know? make its own judgments about that. But the board does have the responsibility to make a decision based on how it feels about and, and I'm not arguing I think what I'm just saying is that if you want to approve a facade you ought to approve it based on exactly on, on, on the plan because anything short of that will 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 not work right that's, well, that's I, I'd like to suggest that this application is is not the time and place for us to impose our first condition um, I like Joe's concept of a workshop but there are a number of concerns that I have that go well beyond this porch. And one is the enforceability of anything we do. One is an architectural definition that we are comfortable uh, for now and in the future is enforceable, is understandable by any future proper, any potential buyer that might purchase the house to know what their limitations are. And to try and design a condition on the fly as we go and impose it um, is something that, that I'm reluctant to do uh, without knowing better the best way to ensure that those kinds of conditions can be enforced um, in the future. Um, the discussion, I think, is well worth having, um, but I don't think we're going to resolve the issue in the bigger philosophical sense tonight in the next 15 minutes or the next hour. So. Uh, if the board feels strongly about a condition, we can go forward with it, and that's certainly within our prerogative. As Mr. Keneally has pointed out, um, under the ordinance, we do have the ability to place a condition, or more than one condition. Um, but I'm reluctant uh, to try and impose it in this case and do it in a way that we're all comfortable with.
this is something that we should pursue further or go forward with uh, the discussion of the other elements of the application? I don't think we should hold up the applicant this evening. I believe that there's, uh, there's a need to get this approved uh, quickly uh, since, you know, it may be warm outside now, but by the time you get a contractor and, and you do, uh, you start ripping and tearing, you're into the, the cooler months and snow might be flying soon. But, um, you know, we're talking about the farmer's porch and, and granting it, but I still have a hard time even considering granting in addition to the front of the building. Um, and uh, I'd be more comfortable with, with a condition that it remains a farmer's porch, which means that it's not to be enclosed other than screen it in. So you're suggesting that one alternative is to approve the application for the second edition without the farmer's porch? Well, that's an alternative, to grant, grant the, uh, uh, the addition to the, uh, the main portion of the home. The farmer's porch is something else, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I know that it may be an integral part of the, of the, um, of the building and the construction process, and, um, you know, I just, I, I just have a concern going that close to the road. That's all. We had we had a, uh, a debate, uh, I believe, a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago, with someone on the other side of town purchased a property and, and asked to uh, to go through major renovations, and we denied it because it was close to the road. Um, you know, the plans show that it is a very integral part in the building, and it's an attractive addition. The neighbors support it, and because of that, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm open-minded on it. But I, I really would be more comfortable if there's some limitations as to what can be done with that porch in the future. The millers are going to be there. They'll probably be there a long, long time. Uh, they may not. Uh, and if they sell it and someone comes in and says, gee, this is beautiful. I want to be able to see the, the sunset. Um, year round, and I want to sit out here uh, at five o'clock in the winter months and watch the sunset. They'll probably want to enclose it and put a, a wood stove or a gas stove in the corner. It's a beautiful shot looking right down the road, and I wouldn't blame them one bit. In fact, if you feel so, you can't stop. You get denied. Um, but I, I would feel more comfortable with with the limitation, and I believe uh, you know Jack. Uh, Jack's on the right track. We can do that. We do have the tools to do it. I think we do. I mean, the, the, I think, as, as Mr. Keneally pointed out, we have the right to impose that condition. Um, I'm not sure it's, 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 it's fair um, to any applicant um, to let it be known that we are going to view these applications in a new light. We've never imposed conditions um, in my tenure which doesn't even come close to the number of years that you've been on the board, Joe. But um, we're suddenly weighing in a whole new criteria and set of factors um, that have never been considered before uh, that I'm aware of. It has been done. It has been done. To impose conditions? Been. Absolutely. On Not the use? Years, yeah. Maybe before, maybe. On the use of, a, of, of an addition. If I may, Mr. Chairman, we do have the right to put a condition. Uh, yes, we do. But what is the merit of a condition in, that's germane to this application? Uh, I, I guess I'm still having difficulty. The applicant is asking for a, um, a set of plans with a front open porch, and, and, in, and the, it includes the variance uh, of up to nine feet. I don't. We. I think we have to go on the value of what the application is, on the, on the merit of that. We cannot, in my mind, predict that 70 years from now, um, everyone in that neighborhood has moved out. Everyone now has enclosed porches, and it's the eyesore of the block uh, because it's not enclosed. I mean, it's, we're, we're trying to, I think, uh, cover every possible 
derangement of what's being asked for openly and honestly in the year on you know, August 28, 2001. And I think the best we can do, unless there's an outcry of either the wisdom of the people on this board or a neighborhood that says we smell something foul here, uh, I think I think a con condition can then have some merit to it. But I have trouble uh, seeing that a, a condition for this particular application rises to merit at this point. I just, I just don't see it in the application. I don't see it in the audience. And I, even though I think this discussion is, is very worthwhile and we seem to keep on having it every couple of months and, and maybe we should have a, a workshop, I'm not quite certain that uh, we should embark on um, you know, how, how do we apply conditions? Is it a sort of a gestalt that um, because of the, <coughs> the neighborhood or uh, there's this potential for abuse? I, mean, I guess I don't know. I think it's a, a, uh, I'm somewhat cautious about going down that, that road without uh, either counsel or out having uh, some guidelines or, or at least a personal sense that something is amiss. Well, I'm willing, if someone wants to make a motion uh, to impose a condition on this application, assuming that the application uh, is granted in its entirety, uh, let's put forth a motion. If there's a second, discuss it and vote it up or down. May I make another comment? Of course you may. Uh, I, I sort of raised this thorny issue because it's been an issue that's been in our minds for a number of cases. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure that this is the particular case that we should use as a hallmark for this particular issue, as you already said. Um, the applicant, I thought, has done an excellent job with the um, data that she provided, or they provided, represented on pages eight and nine, in terms of the uh, setbacks of adjacent and nearby properties, which is data that's really asked for in the practical difficulty standard. But we very seldom, if ever, see it provided to us in as careful a form as um, has been done here. In fact, I would suggest, Bruce, you might want to even make a copy of this and use it as an illustration to future applicants of the kind of data we like to see. Um, coming to the data itself, um, if we use these front setback numbers which are here, which are actually, I guess, setbacks from the pavement as opposed to from the actual right-of-way line, and that's all that the applicant could measure from the other properties. If we take six feet off the 32 feet that she currently has, which is what she's asking for, brings it down to 26 feet, and that front setback is still larger than the average, as far as I can see, of the nearest 10 properties, if I take almost any 10 properties in here. so. So in that sense, the application, no matter whether it's an enclosed structure or an open porch, would satisfy the requirements of the practical difficulty standard. So I introduced that as the flip side of the coin. And because it does satisfy that so well and it's such a documented case, I, I am reluctant to make this the hallmark case for the sensitive issue we've been discussing. Not to uh, throw an unnecessary wrinkle into your comment, yeah. but is it really six feet or is it nine feet uh, that is coming off of the 32 feet? Mm -hmm. The drawings, I thought it was a six foot porch that was Why nine? Um, so what? Even nine foot variance the porch is six feet from the okay. addition. It's to construct an eight foot by 40 foot farm porch. Six foot. Is that right? I'm looking at the agenda. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. The I understood it to be a six foot porch. It's a six foot porch. Um, it's a nine foot variance request because we're already set within setback. Right. So, okay. um, yeah, I was looking at the drawing which shows a six foot extension beyond the current. One point that we didn't make, um, even in, we're talking about concern about this being used later for a room putting up wood burning stove. It's only a six foot wide porch. It's really not designed to put a fire. If you put a wood burning stove in it, you, that's it. You couldn't have anything else. It's really just designed to have a chair and to be able to walk around the chair and sit down. It's not designed to, as a room. So I just may give you some um, some additional. Is thought. it? Yeah, it's is it it's six foot or eight foot? Six foot. Six feet. It's a six foot porch. Yes, I don't know. 
computer. In viewing program. the plan, I don't see how it could easily be converted into what would be considered a living space other than screening it in or perhaps putting a quote unquote storm window, which would be like as Bruce mentioned, closing off um, the space between the uprights with the plexiglass. That would be, in my mind, that's the most you could do with it unless you consider knocking down that front wall. I, I don't see how that porch could be converted into a living space. Jack, thank you for pointing out the setbacks in the uh, neighboring houses. Um, I think in um, another planning board, or the planning board, is looking at uh, subdivisions now uh, with a shorter front yard, uh, interconnecting streets, uh, sidewalks, uh, closeness. Houses are a lot closer, and, and certainly with this house coming closer to the road, uh, sitting on the farmer's porch, you can talk with your neighbors as they walk around in the neighborhood. So what this, what the millers have is um, what uh, Evan Rickett calls the all-American neighborhood. Save the sidewalks. Uh, the setbacks that, that she um, identified are the setbacks from the paved area and not from the center line of the road. Uh, this subdivision, I think, was built in the 60s. Before the 60s? Early 60s. Early 60s. When I think the, set, uh, the front setback was maybe 15 or 20 feet and not much more. Um, we're getting back to that. Uh, people want to get closer to the neighbors. So, um, that, having said that, uh, I make a motion to uh, grant the uh, request of the applicants for a front property line variance of nine feet from the required 25 feet and a left side property line variance of two feet from the required 25 feet to construct a four by 40 farm porch addition in a 20 by 40 foot second floor addition to the existing dwelling located at seven Crescent View Avenue tax map U16 lot 63 located in a residential aid district containing 12,000 15.6 square feet of land. I'll second the motion. Well, I think we need to go through the elements of the the um, ordinance. Okay. Um, before we can get to the final motion, and it sounds like oh. we know where we're headed. But oh, wow. Well. <laughs> um, I do think for for our record, we need to go through the various elements um, and either vote. Uh, both them up or down to know whether the uh, whether the final whether the final motion should be in favor of or opposed. He'll need so, to his motion. Right? No, my motion is there, and we can. Do I? I don't have to withdraw that. I don't know that you have to withdraw the motion, but I think no. before we can actually go ahead to vote on it, um, I'd like to go back okay. through the elements. Sure. Um, so. First, uh, the first element for us to find under the under the ordinance section 19-5-2B1. Um, can we have a show of hands of those members of the board who are satisfied that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance? That's found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, all those, uh, again, a showing of hands of those who find uh, that a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty is defined by 30-A, uh, Main Revised Statutes Annotated Section 4353 4C. Imposed. That element is found in favor by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, all those who find that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, those who find that the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties um, and in determining 
uh, whether a variance would have an unreasonable detrimental effect on the user market value of abutting properties, the board shall consider if the variance would have the effect of blocking an established view, posing a fire safety hazard, casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10% or more, or eliminate, eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property without an effort to mitigate the lost property. The lost privacy, I'm sorry, not property. So all those who find that that element has been uh, satisfied, uh, that's found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, next, all those who find that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. That is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. And all those who find that no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, those who find that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. It's found in favor by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. And last, um, those who find that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas is described in Title 38, Section 435. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Uh, which brings us back to Mr. Frustasi's motion. Um, seconded by Mr. Keneally. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? And the motion carries six in favor, zero opposed, and the application is granted. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Could I say a few things before we adjourn? Absolutely. Uh, Bruce, I'd like to return to that suggestion that I made, the table put together by the Millers to help us understand the average setback is a good illustration to give to any other applicants the kind of data we'd like to see, because it makes it, makes it very easy for us to make certain of our decisions. Um, and also, we'd like to see us have a workshop dealing with the issue we talked about in this case as to if we were to apply a condition of the type we talked about, how it would actually be put into force in a useful and enforceable way. Um, so I think there are cases we've already dealt with that we wish we had done something a little differently. I agree. It's going to come up again. Right. It's a question of when, right. how soon, but it will come up. Would everybody like to see a workshop on that yes. for us to discuss it? Um, I think that's something that we'd certainly like to have uh, Mike Hill's input on. Could you try and arrange that for us sometime in the next couple months, perhaps? Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, communications. We had a couple letters from the town attorney in our packet. We had a uh, notice of a decision in the um, Armstrong appeal. I know of no other communications. Are there any others? Bruce, those are the only ones in the packet. That's it. Any other communications? Last item on the agenda is adjournment. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second? Seconded. All those in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>